Hello there. Um, let me talk a little bit about what we're going to do here. Um, I'm going to be telling you about what happened in Holland. Basically, Frank has already said we've ran a little bit of a campaign over the past half year. We've only been at it since July publicly, a couple months in preparation. Um, I will detail basically, uh, first I'll talk a little bit about black box voting, why it's bad. I don't think I need to spend more than one slide and I don't think I have one more than one slide on that. Uh, there will be lots of discussion, probably there will be people disagreeing, there will be people thinking they have a better system which does work. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but we can do that afterwards. It's much more fun to do that in the discussion. Overall, I'll be clicking through the slides rather, qu rather quickly because that's what I really am mostly here for, is discussion and trying to set things up and trying to work out what we're going to do next. Uh, it's a little bit of a big crowd, but I really like to strategize, really like to sort of get together and figure out what we're going to do. Um, First, I'm going to describe a little bit the situation we found. Then I'm going to be talking about what we did, sort of the events in Holland of 2006, um, the methods we used, the things we learned, uh, sort of go in between the, the timeline, but it's rather chrono chronologic. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what sort of random thoughts about what we've learned afterwards, sort of reflect on, on what to other campaigns, to other countries, and possibly see where we go from there and also try to actively get you to do stuff. Um, okay, so this is what I'm going to do, share what we've learned. We've had a very, very large amount of fun. In fact, I've had more fun over the past six months than I've probably had in the years before. Um, and hopefully I can motivate some of you to spend some time doing activism, whatever activism, changing the world because it can be so much fun. Uh, especially if you're doing it with a little bit of humor and if you're doing it in a way that you can actually win. Um, and I'm going to go through a lot of the things we've learned, also hopefully turning some of you into anti-black box voting activists if you aren't already in your Bundesland or in your nation state or whatever wherever you're at. Um, this is a formal definition of black box voting. Any voting system in which the mechanisms for recording and or tabulating the vote are hidden from the voter and or the mechanism lacks a tangible record of the vote cast. I think Ulrich has already been through this. Who here has been through to Ulrich's talk? Yeah, okay. Not even half. Okay, then I'll, I should get into it a little bit. Um, There is a class of voting machines out there, like the one that's standing here, the same one that is in use, or a very minorly modified version that is in use in large parts of Germany. Um, and that voting machine uh, does not keep any record of the vote other than a software account. And we think that's bad for a number of reasons, mostly because you trust a whole chain of people and organizations with the count of that vote the manufacturer, whoever stored the machine, whoever has once helped the machine, uh, a host of parties dealing with the machine. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we got here and, and how I got to care about this issue and how a lot of other people got to care about this issue. And one of the main points is the USA, is the dirty elections there. Uh, now, USA, USA elections have always been dirty. I wasn't so much informed of this. I knew the popular culture aspects of it, the, the Chicago elections. The, uh, but U.S. elections have always been very dirty. Voter suppression, meaning making sure that, you, that your adversaries people can't get to the polling stations. Most widely known because in the U.S. there's huge lines for uh, uh, sort of the, the urban black population that wants to vote because there's only one voting machine or ten voting machines for a million people. And then in the richer white suburbs, there's like one voting machine per person almost. Um, and a lot of this happens and they, re re they redo the lines of the districts to make sure that whoever is in power stays in power. So there's very dirty elections in the US and, and these dirty elections have been there long before voting machine technology. Um, but we've all seen the 2000 Florida election, the, the lot of brouhaha about uh, paper cards and figuring out where the punch went. And as a reaction to that, uh, the U.S. Congress passed the Helping America Vote Act, or HAVA. 
And what Hava did is designate about three and a half billion dollars uh, for all the states and all the counties, because voting is, is organized on a county level, for all the counties to basically buy voting machines. Uh, and to buy them so quickly, I think, I think all orders had to be signed by summer 2007, I think. Uh, uh, so buying them so quickly that nobody had a chance to look at this technology, no, nobody could ask any questions, and the money was free for the counties anyway. So basically all of America now bought voting machines, or a lot of America now bought voting machines. Um, then there's the whole controversy. There, there's uh, uh, organizations in America, the most well-known is black box voting, but there's a whole host of organizations in America that deal with voting machine technology. Uh, then there was the 2004 bush Kerry race, which saw a lot of irregularities in Ohio, in Florida, uh, and in 2006, but of course, this was after our campaign, there was the Florida 13, the, the district where thousands and thousands of votes, I think 18,000 votes were lost because of a voting machine error, quote unquote. Um, then there's also Ireland, which is important in Holland because Ireland bought 50 million euros worth of Dutch voting equipment and then studied it and decided never to use it. So those 50 million, <laughs> Those 50 million euros worth of machines, well, we personally think the kickbacks were already paid, so. Uh, but these 50 million euros worth of machines are already, are sitting in some army barracks in Ireland, probably never to be used. There are some in government that still claim, yes, we're going to be using them next year, really, really, really. But there's an Irish campaign very much like ours, called the Irish Citizens for Trustworthy E-Voting. And they've done a really good job of, of, of pointing out where the flaws are, the, where, the, where the, the logical errors are in, in, in trusting one of these machines in keeping the count, and why that system is, is much worse than anything they've had before. And the Irish, mind you, have a, an, a hellishly complex counting system, where everybody casts three votes and the votes have an order, so you vote for the, the first preference, then the second, then the third, and then the counting is done in multiple rounds, and, and if you don't get past a certain hurdle in the first count, then everything's recounted and reshuffled and restacked. So they have a hugely complicated system. Um, I, in 2004, I remember reading the technical reports on the NIDAP machine and learning about my own country's voting system more than I had ever been able to find out, because I had tried a little bit, more than I had ever been able to find out by asking NADOP, uh, the manufacturers, or by asking a TNO, the, the Dutch institution that tests these machines, that certifies them. Um, and the Irish reports also explicitly mentioned, well, listen, anybody can just change the EPROMs in this thing, can just change the software, and then it would run any software you want. Um, in Holland, elections are very simple. I'll, I'll paint a little bit the Dutch sort of landscape. Elections are very simple. There's only one vote per election, no citizen initiatives, very few referenda, never many elections. Here's a list of some of the actors. There's the Ministry of the Interior. It's a little bit of a complicated situation that won't bother you with too much, but there's actually two ministers in, at the Ministry of the Interior, and one is the Minister for Government Renewal and, uh, and Colonies, although we, we're not call, calling them colonies anymore. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so that's the, the responsible minister, but it's the Ministry of the Interior. Then there's Kiesrat, a little bit like the German Bundeswahlleiter. Uh, and they do publish the results for national elections, but they don't actually organize the election. The Ministry of the Interior does, so it's a little bit of a different structure. Then there's Brightside, formerly called TNO ITSEF, before that called TNO, which is the testing institute, just a regular commercial company. There's, there's no state involvement whatsoever. Uh, and then there's the voting machine manufacturers, in our case, NEDAP and SDU. And of course, the elections themselves are organized by the municipalities. So, the government can provide guidelines and legislation, but the actual responsibility for the, for the vote is with the municipalities. Then there's a bunch of legislation. There's the Constitution, which says basically elections have to be fair and honest, and they have to be by secret ballot and, and uh, proportional representation. 
but don't go into details. Um, there's the election law, a little bit like the, the German situation. Then there's the election order. Uh, the election law basically has just one or two uh, uh, paragraphs which say that you can also do it differently, and in that case, everything that applies to pa pieces of paper doesn't apply anymore. Uh, but that the minister must, must make a, um, an order uh, for that to be, to be legal, and then that order is the election order, and underneath that is the approval regulations, which the minister can just change at the, at the stroke of a pen, and that the approval regulations, uh, uh, that's where it says what the voting machine should be. Very, very similar to the German situation. Company formerly known as TNO and TNO itself now called Brightside. Um, and that testing doesn't happen at the order of government. It happens at the order of the companies that want to be certified to have their machine ready for the Dutch market. So this company doesn't have a client relation at all with, uh, with the government. They have no responsibility towards the government. Their only responsibility is towards the voting machine company. They have to certify that it matches the regulations. Now, these regulations say everything about environmental factors, how much shock should it resist, uh, vibration. You must be able to spill a glass of water on it and it should still function. It should never shock you electrically. Uh, it can shock you in many other ways, but not electrically. Um, the buttons have to be of a certain size and readability. There's all sorts of user interface specifications in those regulations. But this, the entire concept of, of somebody trying to steal votes doesn't appear. Computer security doesn't appear. That whole concept is absent, as if nobody would ever want that. Um, so protection against whatever manipulation is left up to the manufacturers. Um, as I said, there's two manufacturers. There's NADOP, and they've made a couple of machines. The ES3A is still in use in some places. It's a slightly older version of this. ES3B, and then there's a new version of this, uh, which I'll get into in a moment as we, as we do the, uh, the NADAP machines in more detail. But the newer machine is still a 68,000-based machine. It just uses service mount parts because they couldn't get the through holes anymore. Um, it's still the same machine that they built years and years ago. And then there's SDU. We'll get into a lot, of more, NADAP, a lot more NADAP further on, don't worry. Um, SDU makes uh, a machine that looks like this. It's actually an embedded Windows machine, as you'll soon see. They used to make something called the STEM PC. STEM is our word for, for vote or, or VAL. Um, a STEM PC is, is, a, is a regular PC with a touchscreen that was put up by the, by the municipalities. And they had software licenses for a software package called RS Vote, which dealt with the touchscreen. It was just a Windows program that counted the votes. And now they've basically taken that RS vote program, which was once built by Alcatel Belgium and then sold. And it's a piece of crap, everybody says. Um, but uh, uh, that was then put in a box with an embedded motherboard, embedded PC, and that box is now called New Vote. Now, New Vote is special because you can't buy a New Vote, you buy an election. <laughs> you know. What happens, what happens is the election is completely outsourced. The computers are owned by SDU. SDU trains your poll workers, the people in the polling stations. Uh, and SDU basically tells the city what the outcome was in the evening. So, um, and in the case of, of, uh, 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 of uh, 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 regional governments within cities, they wanted to use the, they wanted these governments because they couldn't install the software on all these different precincts because there was all these different problems with, uh, uh, so they figured, why don't we just install Citrix and then these people can look at the results on our servers. So basically, this is completely outsourced. There's com minimal involvement, if any, by city of officials. So it's really, really easy if you're a city official. You just call SDU. Now, SDU is our former state printing press. It's a little bit like the, Selbstständigte Bundesdruckerei. Um, and they got into this business because they used to make all the forms used for elections. So they, they used to really, as their, as their publishing business, they used to print stuff for elections. That's how they got here. Um, 
As I said, it's Windows PC running Windows XP, and it has a built-in GPRS wireless modem, of course. Uh, <laughs> mind you that there's absolutely no specifications regarding security, none whatsoever. Uh, you could legally uh, uh, have a Windows 95 box with uh, uh, the first version of, of Internet Explorer uh, and an open ADSL line uh, with no NAT, and that would still be a legal voting machine as long as the buttons were a certain size and it resists <laughs> vibration. And um, now, the Dutch environment comes with a lot of e-voting is perfectly safe, just trust us. And the Ministry of the Interior in 2004, in response to this Irish thing, said, in contrast to elections using paper ballots, the count of an electronic election cannot possibly be wrong. So there's no, no, never a need for a recount. And then he also said... Oh, but the Irish situation is so different, and the software is specially made for Ireland. It's, it's, it's not even comparable to the Dutch machines, even though they're based on the same technology. Uh, so all of these Irish security problems that you've read about, they, they don't really apply here. Uh, no need to worry. Um, another disturbing thing that's happening in Holland, or that was already happening before we started getting involved, is internet voting. Um, in Holland, we have a sort of an, another structure of government. Uh, we have the, the, the municipalities, the provinces, and the national government, and then, of course, the European Parliament elections. But we have a completely different body called the Waterschap. And those are the, the governmental bodies that deal with dikes and, and pumping the water out. And those are actually the oldest democratic structures in Holland. And supposedly they're the reason that Dutch governments until now have been fairly stable is because we needed governments to be fairly stable and we needed governments to take decisions that would only benefit us 20 or 30 years from now because otherwise we'd get wet feet. Um, so they've built a system called RIES, R-I-E-S, and that's an internet voting system. It's actually kind of neat because everybody gets a DES key and everybody gets to vote. Um, uh, Everybody gets to, uh, gets to vote, and then afterwards uh, they publish a file, and everybody can use their receipt that they got, their cryptographic receipt. It's all generated on your own computer using JavaScript. And <laughs> but the cryptographic receipt that you got from the server can then be used to verify that your vote is counted correctly. Uh, and they've, they've, done, uh, they've calculated all the hashes for all the possible votes that you could do before giving you that DES key. Um, elections as sort of an alternative to polling stations. For a while they would say, yeah, you can still go to the polling station, but they would use RIS as an alternative way to cast your vote. Um, now, for me, that's, that's a definite no-no, and for a lot of people around me, that was a definite no-no, because you want to see under which circumstances people vote. If you don't, any power relationship, any, any control relationship in society uh, will be abused. Uh, the, the standard example is uh, 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 husbands and wives, uh, especially from macho cultures, uh, but there's lots of other examples. There's uh, uh, students, uh, uh, student uh, uh, unions or student clubs or, or any uh, employer-employee. Any relationship in society can be abused in the sense of, hey, let's go vote together, oh, really. Um, so you want to monitor the circumstances under which a vote is cast, and it's really... Um, to me, it was heartbreaking to see people of the Ministry of the Interior sort of trying to negotiate away that point. Yeah, but that's sort of important, but other things are other also important. Um, the secrecy of the ballot is not protected enough in this particular case because the DES keys are then sent to you as something you can enter. So, so I think it was uh, converted to ASCII without the zeros and the I's and the... Um, so convert it to some typable form and then put in some security, print it inside of a security envelope and send to you. So somebody, of course, has to have all this data to be able to send you that key. Now that somebody is, uh, uh, they didn't disclose who it was, but it's probably SDU because they have a lot of experience with security printing. And so at one of the, the, the technical gatherings where they explained this system, I had to ask them, so, so let, me let me get this right. You're giving somebody uh, the keys that they can use to calculate what everybody else has voted. Because with that key, you can calculate all the, all the possible votes and thus calculate, see what that person has voted with that control file that they post at the end of each election. 
And you're giving that to a, to a printing press where everybody has security clearances, meaning hundreds of people there depend for their livelihood on, on the intelligence community. That's interesting. Um, and then there's the, even though they have published some of the software really late, like a day before the election, because they weren't done yet. <laughs> Scary, huh? Um, but they have used it this year as a replacement for the postal ballot, which is all, also a terribly insecure system which doesn't have secrecy of the ballot protected well enough. Uh, so as a replacement for the postal ballot, they've used it this year, figuring there wasn't much criticism because the other system was pretty cooked also. Uh, but that was also happening before we started. And then as Frank said, last year we did, we did our talk. And we basically said that because we lost the privacy war, it's become e ever more important to hang on to democracy because you cannot ever let it slip anymore because you, you've basically lost any method of regaining it clandestinely for any, in any case. Um, and because all of us could use a conflict, we could win. Um, and then also some of us got to vote on the SDU new vote machine. I personally, in March, for the, for the municipal elections this year, I was first confronted with this machine and I pressed this button and it was just the eerie feeling. All of Holland has been e-voting forever and ever. I think 60% of the country was already e-voting in 1990. Uh, so Holland is, is, is pretty much 100% e-voting and Amsterdam was the last major city to not have it. And then they switched and they bought STU Nouveau or, or they hired STU Nouveau to do the election and that was sort of the last straw for a number of us. I remember Barry who you all know from his lockpicking things, and myself, both independently from each other, uh, being fumingly mad at the polling station and being faced by people that didn't understand. Yeah, but they're tested. Don't worry. It's all good. Uh, uh, and in fact, he was even told at his polling station, well, if you, if you don't trust it, then why don't you just not vote? Goodbye, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then a lot of strategy also formed before and during Datenspuren in Dresden, the conference where a lot of us, a lot of people that I know from Germany met and we sort of talked about, we can't let this happen, we must do something. So Barry and myself basically initiated a campaign in the Netherlands uh, called Wij vertrouwen stemcomputers niet, don't try to pronounce that. Uh, it means we don't trust voting computers. And it has been very successful despite the hideously ugly domain name that you see over there. <laughs> okay, our campaign strategy has been to go easy. Um, the Dutch public is 99% e-voting. So we didn't want to say we must go back to paper, so instead we said we must have a trustworthy system, be it paper or be it something with voter verified viable paper audit trail, meaning tickets that you can actually see and then put in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in the uh, voting container. But we must have something uh, that is trustworthy. Germany is different, of course, because the large scale rollout hasn't happened. We have 10,000 machines for 17 million people covering the entire country, basically. And Germany has less than 2,000 machines, I think, for a much bigger country. Um, and we completely skipped the issue of internet voting because not many people knew about it. There, wasn't, there hadn't been huge press. And there wasn't any time to do the research right. An interesting aspect is we call them voting computers, whereas legislation and NADOP and, and, and government, everybody called them voting machines. Um, we figured it was really much easier for people to understand that this was a computer, if we called it a computer. It's not a machine. A machine is like a washing machine or a typing machine. You open it up and you see what it's doing. You see the little le lever that goes between the key that, that says A and, and the hammer that, that puts the A on the paper. Here, this is, this is a box that just runs software and it could run any software and you have no means without actually taking out the software and disassembling it, you have no means of seeing what that software does. Um, we gambled that we could dictate what it would be called and it's worked. Meaning, right now, mainstream media never, almost never uses, uses voting machine anymore. It's always voting computer. 
we'll see why that is later. Um, I started doing a lot of research in May. We still were like four or five people. There was a very small group. There wasn't any really well-formed strategy, but I figured I would start doing research, and I knew a person that could do uh, FOIA requests. I'll get to that later. Uh, Informationsfreiheitsgesetz. With us, it's called WOB. But I started doing research. I started figuring out how it really worked. And you'd wonder why, because we already knew that it was bad. Gut instincts told us that we were completely insecure. We felt that it was plain wrong. And the everything is fine facade didn't have too much in the way of building behind it. But of course, you need facts. You can't convince people if you don't know precisely what's wrong, if you don't know, if you can be beaten on facts, if anybody from the interior ministry or anybody from one of the manufacturers from NADOP can say, well, but you didn't know that in, in 98 parliament already passed such a thing and we've already dealt with that. So you must know it all. And if you can't prove it, if you can't show the dead body, then there has been no murder. Um, we've gotten to a point where, where we've been right on so many occasions, and we've said so many things that have proven to be true, that by now the entire Dutch press trusts us on this issue and completely distrusts NADOP, the Interior Ministry, and every, everybody else involved. Uh, and a lot, of that, a lot of that is very hard work by a, by a large group of people. There's like 10 of us updating the website putting new news articles on, uh, updating parliamentary uh, documents we can find, really making sure that, that everything we say is actually backed by facts and is true. I talked a little bit about freedom of information legislation. We call it WOB. You call it IFG here in Germany. It's probably called differently in all sorts of other European countries. Um, get to know that legislation. No matter what you're doing, if you ever want to find out what your government is doing, use that legislation to its maximum potential because it's incredibly powerful. Uh, it's like casting the, the demon spell. It's like, uh, um, uh, you see them, uh, the, the 27B stroke six, you see them freeze in place and then, oh my God, we have to give them all the documents. Um, we used it extensively. The, the German law is, a, is slightly more limited. It's especially more costly but apparently it's only more costly if you then in the end decide to actually get the documents. So there's all sorts of, sorts of ways around it, I, I hear, but that's something you definitely need to be up to date on. This is some of the questions that you can ask. Well, I'm glad that's actually readable. Um, like uh, all the documents needed to create another document or other documents, we need to create an overview. Uh, so there's certain phrases that you use to make sure that you get the, the broad palette of documents. We write our, our current uh, freedom of information requests are like five pages, four or five pages of small print. And you have to be slightly careful with this uh, because you are causing a lot of work and it can make you a lot of enemies. Um, I've actually learned since doing my first FOIA requests that with a day of writing a, a freedom of information request, with, with, within one day, from sitting down wanting to write it to actually bringing it to the post office to get it sent there as registered mail, uh, with that one day you can cause three months of work at whatever bureaucracy you're sending that to. So it's asymmetric warfare to the max. <laughs> but I've also since learned that there's a huge crowd of people that, that do this all the time. Uh, which I'm not sure I approve of. I, I think that what we're doing is really important, and I do this because I think it's really important, and there's lots of people, I've, I found out that there's people, not lots of people, but there's a few people out there that just do this because they're annoyed with some part of government, which I'm not sure I would advocate, because we don't want to lose that legislation to trolling. It's really important legislation, it tells us what our government is doing, and that's a privilege that we should use wisely, I think. Um, all the documents that shed light on the exact logistics of getting machines to and from polling stations. Uh, so you can actually make your government tell you, well, who do you hire for security and where do you store them and, and what do you do and what, what's the brand of the alarm system? Um, as you can see, documents dealing with the last, these are just some example questions. 
The fourth one is really interesting because it's all documents which re and co correspondence which was created as a result of my previous request. Emails and documents. Of course, there's headers that say documents can also be emails and, and uh, 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 formal requests and quotes and, and anything, uh, uh, anything on paper or on disk or on any carrier information. Um, and you can also ask secondary questions. If you don't get documents, you, you can also still get the meta information. So use this legislation. We put it all on the net. Uh, I'll show you some of that later if we still have time afterwards. But we basically put everything on the net. Uh, make sure you delete their telephone numbers. We didn't do that in the beginning, and it caused them a lot of grief because all sorts of people started calling the contact lawyer or the contact uh, civil servant that handled our, our FOIA requests, which is not something you want because you need those people to service your request and to talk to you and to talk logistics about your request with you. Um, but we basically have the whole correspondence from sending the letter to asking why they haven't sent you anything yet, to them responding, well, it's a lot of work, uh, to sort of the whole logistics of getting you the documents. Um, and we also found that our website was a really good place to put them so we didn't lose them. Um, then in, uh, I think, end of June, we learned that our government had fallen and uh, uh, that the elections were actually six months early. We had our whole campaign, basically we started in, in or we seriously started working in May, June, and we were figuring we would sort of peak towards May. There, were, there, there would be provincial elections in March. There still are. This coming March, there's provincial elections. And then the big one would be the parliamentary election, the national parliament elections in May. Now, these parliamentary elections happened in November, so we had to do a lot of things early. They had to do a lot of things early as well, so they were very busy as well, which has helped us in many cases. And there was an election scandal in a small town, which posed an opportunity for us to get some publicity much earlier than we thought we would be able to otherwise. But I'll get to that later. Um, so we needed a website and a logo, and Antenna designed this really great logo for us. In Holland, we, uh, we vote with a red pencil. It's not a ballpoint, it's, it's just a red pencil. And we thought this was really powerful. Um, and we launched this website. Now, those of you in the know recognize the little character up there in the right. And yes, it is actually a media wiki. Um, we loved the media wiki technology because our campaign was just too fast for anything else. Um, uh, there was just so much happening and, and we figured there would be so much vandalism because it would be in the press all the time and, and, uh, and there was almost none. Uh, we did have captchas so, because otherwise it would be all about Viagra and all other link spam, but uh, it's definitely, any political campaign should, should have their website as a wiki, but we liked the fact that it had a skin to make it look like a regular website so it wasn't so wiki-ish. Um, uh, and it's also great to find new people that do stuff because you actually find new people that are working on your website that you didn't know before and that are doing great stuff and you end up inviting them and working with them. Um, very early on, we also decided that we needed to explain what we were about and explain this weird notion of, of, of voting machines, as everybody knew them, not being trustworthy. Um, so we built a comic strip. Uh, this is with the German text. And this is actually the, it's much longer. It's, it's, this is a quarter of it. But this is the Magic Vote Black Box 2 machine that has a person inside that grabs your, your ballot paper and then shreds it and keeps account on a piece of paper inside. Um, which we use to sort of drive home to people, look, this is, what, this is what it's about, this is what the problem is. I need to drink a little bit of water. Hang on. Or I'll dry out. Good stuff. Um, so yeah, we had during the March elections, the ones where I, I was voting on this STU new vote machine, there's a, a, a municipality in Holland called Landert, and in Landert they had an election, 
and a gentleman by the name of Guste Meerman was a village alderman, and he was up for re-election, and he was also a poll worker operating one of these machines, the NEDAP. And he rearranged the polling station so that everybody would be sitting with their back towards him, uh, because they could do, then do the paper thing, you know, are you eligible to vote? And then they would send the voter to him, and then he would press the button. And this was a home for the elderly, and he got 180 votes in that station, and he got seven in all the other stations in that municipality. <laughs> and both NADOP and NFI, and NFI is our forensics people, looked at that machine, and the funny thing is they looked at it in that order. So NADOP could have done anything to that machine before the NFI got it. Uh, and they could find nothing wrong with the machine. And the police investigation is now complete, and they're charging him with election fraud. And the current theory as to what happened is that uh, 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 the elderly people never pressed, or most of the elderly people never pressed the red vote button. So they, they just pressed their candidate. And then he would go in and press himself and hit vote. So there was no, no major technology thing involved. It was just uh, a human fraud more than anything. So Nadab said, well, that's such a, a breach of procedure. If you, if you get two people out of the three not to watch what you're doing during a vote, then you can also rig a paper vote. You can just replace the ballots. You can just take the paper out of people's hands and, and get rid of it. But then you would still need to get rid of that paper. And the thing is also that people understand how a paper vote works, and they understand what its security depends on. They understand how it can fail. So if you say, well, I'll just take that piece of paper and I'll put it in the ballot box later, people understand, hey, wait a second. Whereas with an electronic system, it's much harder to understand, at least for people that are not into figuring out what electronic system security depends on, it's much harder to figure out in which ways the security can fail. Okay, so now we existed, we had the website, uh, we were making our point, and we were making it with some facts behind it. It wasn't just voting machines can't be trusted, it was voting machines can't be trusted because the regulation doesn't say anything about this, and because... Uh, so we made our point, but we, we had a lot of facts to back it up. Uh, and we were kind of disheartened to find that the first reactions we got were from crazy people. I've always known that the aliens are controlling everything and they're also controlling voting machines. Um, if you do something like this, you find out how many paranoid people there are in the world, and there are quite a few. <laughs> um, and any paranoid person that, that believes government has fallen into the hands of aliens must explain how, these peop how people keep voting for governments and how things happen, and manipulated voting machines are, 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 make total sense. Um, they'll believe anything you say, but they'll also believe that vapor trails behind airliners are part of a government plot, uh, so they're pretty useless. Um, we also got a mail from the ministry really early, um, and they said basically in, that, in, a, in a slightly longer email, but this is the gist of it, uh, dear Mr. Hongreip, we're taking it very seriously. Uh, 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 oh my God, oh my God, let's come talk, and maybe, we can, we, maybe you can help us raise public confidence in e-voting. Um, to which I replied, well, it sounds like we are the problem and not e-voting. Uh, and if you just retract some of these statements, like uh, it can never be wrong, so it doesn't ever re need a recount, uh, then we can both bury it properly and we can get rid of it. Uh, and right now, increasing the level of confidence is not in our nor in the country's best interest. Um, to which there was never any reply. Um, and then Jan Groenendaal, who is the, the maker of that machine and the software that sits behind it, also reacted. He puts PDF documents on his website every once in a while when he feels bad about something. Um, it's sort of his, his way of doing a weblog. And <laughs> now this, read this text. I'm not going to read it to you. Read this text and let it roll over your tongue. Sort of taste the words, especially that middle sentence.
So this is their view of computer security. Um, by that time, we were getting results from the freedom of information requests that we did. And the first results we got were from Amsterdam, uh, where there's ever only been one e-vote, the March 2006 uh, local elections. And we basically found evidence that the election was completely outsourced. Uh, most of the things that I just told you about STU New Vote, we learned from the documents we got through the Freedom of Information request. It's to what extent? Also, elections had become much more expensive. We used to pay $1.6 million per vote, and now it's 2.7, and they didn't buy any equipment for that $1 million difference. It was just service. Um, then uh, they also gave us a lot of documents that, had, uh, that they didn't have to give us, that were copyrighted by STU, some by NADOP, because they had also given us both the bids for the, for the tender that they had put out. And they had given us a lot of documents that basically had uh, uh, um, uh, uh, non-disclosure agreements as part of the document, uh, making them liable for all sorts of, of mayhem if they were ever disclosed. So both, all of which are, are perfectly legal grounds for refusing uh, a freedom of information request, but they still gave them to us. And then we put them online, and then uh, uh, they called saying, oh, um, um, SDU is a little mad, can you please take it back off? Um, uh, uh, to which we said, which part of publication don't you understand? Uh, and uh, uh, also, we said, well, okay, well, uh, how about this? Uh, have SDU, their lawyers, contact us. So this lawyer from SDU, a very expensive firm, contacts me by email. Uh, uh, asking forward that email straight to the press. Uh, <laughs> which, which created one of the first media hypes that we created. Uh, basically circling through the entire, all the press in, in the country had the story that SDU wanted documents removed from the website, secret documents. It got crazier every time, every new article. Uh, 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 some, somebody wrote that we had published the software and, and uh, insane, but uh, really good. And it really helped us to publicize the other two points, which was that the election was outsourced and that it was a million euros more expensive, which people didn't realize. You have to realize people think that this computerization of the elections is happening because it's much cheaper and more efficient. Once you drive home that it's actually more expensive, people go, but then why are we doing it? Um, then there was also the freedom of information findings from the ministry where we found that nobody has any clue how the equipment works. Nobody knows. Nowhere in government. They depend on software that is written by a man who's about to retire and they don't know what to do. Even the Kiesrat, which is the, the sort of the Bundeswahlleiter, wrote, uh, wrote documents to the minister in panic saying, what, are, what is the country going to do when this guy retires and nobody wants to make the software anymore? Uh, it's a bit of a crazy niche business, writing election softwares. <laughs> um, and we also noticed that lots of people write the ministry. The ministry always said, well, there's never been any criticism or it's always been non-controversial. Holland has always been the example country. It's completely non-controversial. E-voting is, is... Nobody really mistrusts it. And we found that lots of people actually did and wrote letters because we asked for those letters and any answers to them. Lots of people did, and lots of people got very reassuring answers. Well, they were all tested, and, and it must be secure because, because this institute was testing the security, which, of course, wasn't true. Um, during this month in August, we also become legit. We get our own office. We set up a foundation. We do some fundraising, and we get a paid staffer for a few months. So we can actually campaign full bore. We can actually go at it and, and make sure that we can handle whatever they throw at us. Because there's a lot of media campaign going to happen, and most of that is because we get one of these. Now, the most interesting thing about this is the type plate, which you see on the right front there. Because until now, everybody had called it Stemmaschine, Wahlmaschine. And we were very heartened to find that they actually called it STEM computer as well. <laughs> uh, 
Now, this was at a time that they already knew that we were up to something. Uh, I have a history in this country, in, in Holland, and, and they know a little bit. Uh, they knew where this was headed. Let's, let's put it that way. So they, like crazy, they tried to make sure that we wouldn't get hold of a NADOP. They actually sent letters to all the communities, uh, a little bit too late, <laughs> um, to governments asking them to be very careful with their NADOPs, never to sell them to anybody, never to lend them to anybody. And then uh, Barry manages to buy two NADOPs. We lent, we lent one from one community, and then we bought two more. This is one of the two machines we bought for 3,000 euros. And then we got all the accessories to go with it, meaning the voting memory modules and the, uh, uh, the box to read the, to read the memory. You'll see that in a movie clip later. Uh, for $3,000 and a cake. And the cake was for... The cake... Uh, it was... Uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, whipped cream pie. Um, <laughs> But we, um, uh, the cake was actually for all the accessories. Because she wasn't sure what to, what, what to charge for that because she wasn't sure what it was worth. And Barry said, well, if I throw in a really big cake, is that okay? Well, I guess. <laughs> um, now, how we, how we found this NADAP is by going through a list of all the municipalities that have merged. Because usually if municipalities, municipalities merge, and I'm sure there's a lot of that happening in Germany as well, uh, they have leftover accessories because they only need one set, and they may even have leftover NADAPs because they've lowered the number of, of districts or regions. Um, so yeah, that's what happened. Uh, basically what we told this community that we were buying them from is that our company was going to do uh, uh, workers' collective elections. And that as a large company, we would, we would need to sort of multiple locations. You know, we would need these devices. Um, and they were very glad to get rid of them because they were, they were, they were written off and, and any money was just extra money. Um, so we were doing these, these worker elections and then once we got them, uh, we figured out that, yes, we were only six people. Maybe we don't need to do elections yet on a machine. So we sold them to the foundation. Um, <laughs> So we spent, we spent the month after getting the machine, hacking the machine, reverse engineering it in any possible way. And before I get into that, there's something to be said about that. We tried to convey this as often as we could, and, and we, we even succeeded on a few occasions, on quite a few occasions. But this isn't about computer security. It's not about whether some uh, 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 crazy crowd of, of, of 500 ninja fighters that breaks into government buildings can manipulate the vote. It's about whether we want to replace verifiability by blind trust in a system that we can't audit. But actually being able to prove that it could be manipulated got us the press to get that message across. Um, there's a lot of stuff we did, and a lot of stuff about the hack uh, is also in some of the movies I'm going to show you. Um, so I'm just clicking through them really quickly because, and there's also a lot of it on the web. A lot of you probably have already seen some of the documents or have read some of the web coverage about it. There's a report that gives you all the technical detail that I'm skipping right now, uh, just because I figured a lot of people would have read it already. Um, but this is the key that needs to be kept in the safe when there's no election. That's actually the standing instruction for, for municipalities. As soon as the election is over, these, these keys go back into the, into the municipal safe. If this, was on your, if this was on your mailbox downstairs in your apartment building, you would complain to, the, to, the, to, the, to whoever rents you the apartment. And after every vote, the chairman of the, of the commission puts it in a sealed envelope, a sort of a, a, a magic gesture ceremonial, putting it in the sealed envelope. Um, I'm going to be clicking through a lot of things here. Um, basically, this is what we found when we opened the box. Uh, when we unscrewed it, we found a motherboard. You'll see some footage of it later. Uh, we found a motherboard with a 68,000 processor, or really 68,000, not a 6820, nothing modern, just a really, really old 68,000. Um, with the 40 by 4 LCD screen and the foil keyboard that you see in front of you, the, um, oh, I can walk, gee, I'm free. Um, uh, 
Underneath this piece of paper, which is covered by plastic, is actually 36 by 30 foil switches. So all the candidate names are printed on a piece of paper, which you order from, from the printing company. You don't do that yourself um, for local elections. Um, and then the candidate names are printed on here, and then you press a candidate. It shows the name of the candidate, and then you press vote. And then it registers the vote both on um, one of these modules. I'll show them in some close-up later as well. Basically, just a, a little circuit board with two flash chips on them. And at the end of the day, it also prints out the results on a little thermal cash register printer, um, which you both see there. The, the two times 128 kilobyte flash and the cash register printer. For the operator, there's also a little console. This is what the, this is what the, the, poll, the poll workers press. Every time somebody gets to vote, they press this button. And if there's two elections, this hand, device can handle up to two elections. They have two buttons. Like, for instance, you may be eligible to vote for local elections because you're a foreigner uh, resident but you may be not eligible to vote for parliament, in which case they will not press the second button. So, and there's a key. This is the, the famous high security key. And that's... And the, the document that comes out, the, the printout that comes out, is actually has the status of a legal document. It's, it's the process for Baal. It's the, the Dutch legal document that describes the, the outcome of the election, and it's actually signed by all the, by all the poll workers. Um, Everything between these components uh, is 74 series glue logic. There's no PALs for those of you into electronics. This is like the, the most bland, standard, vintage processor board that you could find. It's, it's 1980s technology. It was probably designed, um, or, or predecessors of it were designed in the early 80s. And this, this particular version is from the late 80s. And then later versions of this device with minor modifications were also sold in all other European countries. So for instance, the German machine, the ESD1, is this made up but with a different, slightly different box for the, for the Wahlhelfer, because in Germany some uh, uh, polling stations are designated to get Wahlstatistik. So they actually get, uh, uh, they do statistic on, on uh, 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 sex and age group of the, of the people coming to vote and they have to press different buttons for, for the voters so that they can do statistics. And they, they incorporated that by putting more buttons on that little box, and the, uh, uh, they fixed some other things. Um, and then another version of that device was then sold to France, where I think they replaced the EEPROMs in it by flash. So you can actually remote, by, by inserting a cartridge, you can change the, uh, the ROM, which is real handy. Um, and then uh, uh, a newer version of that then came back to Holland and is now the other machine that I just talked to you, showed you, the ESN1, SSN1. So there's multiple iterations of it, but it's still the same 68,000-based system. Uh, they had to make changes reluctantly, basically because the only places they could get their parts was in, in electronics antique shops. Um, uh, they were running out of EEPROMs, they were running out of, of, of through-hole components uh, 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 for a lot of that board. So they had to make new revisions basically as soon as, they, as, as the antique prices went up. So first we had to figure out a memory map. I'm sure you can't read this, or sort of. Uh, part of this is re reverse engineering from the board. And part of it is uh, uh, looking at the code which I'll get into next, but basically figuring out where each line on that, on that system went, figuring out what everything was. With IDA, you could actually disassemble the code, and then everything you see here, like read candidate info, that's of course meaning that wasn't there, that's meaning that we had to apply. And this is a tiny, tiny fraction. Um, 256 kilobytes, which, which is what's in there, only half of it is full, but that's still a lot of code if you have to go through it. Uh, fortunately, we had some people that are very, very, very good at that. Um, Jan Groenendaal said uh, much, much, much earlier in the discussion, as he would be, just became aware of our campaign, one of the claims we had made is, look, it's just a computer. 
And, and as sort of to support that claim, we said, well, it can be programmed to, to honestly count the elections, to honestly count the votes, but it can also just as easily be programmed to dishonestly count the votes, or it could be programmed to, to play chess. And then as a reaction in one of his PDF documents, Jan Grunendahl wrote, uh, nah, can't do that. So, of course, this was our, major, our main challenge when we understood the machine. <laughs> now, it was a good test to see if we understood what the, uh, if we understood all the input-output, it was a good test to see if we really knew the machine well enough to start messing with the software that was already on there. Uh, but unfortunately, the machine only had 16 kilobytes of RAM. So we found a tiny old-style chess program that just fit, and we had to squeeze off a lot of tables. So its chess is pretty atrocious. <laughs> but it knows all the rules, it knows en passant, it can do everything, but it's just, it's not a very strong player as a result of, of, of the 16 kilobyte limit. Um, I'll show you some of that later because there's a little movie. Um, but uh, then we felt more confident and we felt that we could actually mess with their software. And we called our software NADA Power Fraud. And this is because <laughs> they actually market their systems as NADA Power Vote in English-speaking countries, or at least in England and in Ireland. So we figured Power Fraud was a fitting name. Um, it's vote-stealing software that is very clever about when not to steal. Um, meaning, uh, basically what we did is there's a little bit of EEPROM in there that stores settings and it also stores an error log and an event log, which are really useless because it doesn't have a real-time clock. But um, there's some memory in there that we could use and we actually shortened one of the logs uh, so that we had 500 bytes left over. And in those 500 bytes, we put the 16-bit uh, uh, integers, uh, uh, how many votes we stole from which party. And we only stole if people voted for the number one of a party, which is what most, what most people do. So we stole the votes, but we stuck them in a, in a special place because we couldn't stick them on the module because we couldn't erase the module. Because the module can only be erased in the special box that they use to read the modules at the, at the city hall. So we couldn't write to that module, which was their idea of security. Uh, it was really implemented in a funny way. If you want to see how that was done, read the, read the documentation because it's really interesting. Um, but, uh, so we couldn't, read them, we couldn't write them to the blue module because we couldn't erase it. We couldn't take it back off again. Uh, so what we did instead is we stuck it in the settings ROM and then at the end of the vote, when people closed the totals, when people said, okay, voting is over now with the little key and then pressing some buttons, then we said, okay, let's now figure out if this was a real election. So if the election only lasted two hours, then it wasn't a real election. So we write back all those votes to the parties that they were supposed to go to. So if somebody does a little test election, if somebody only issues 50 votes, that wasn't a real election. So we write it all back to the party that we're supposed to go to. So any testing you do, doesn't show that it's a fraudulent device. Uh, and if you go, we didn't do this, but if you go as far as to do stats on the timings between when, the, when you press the release button, when the candidate is pressed, and when the vote button is pressed, now, there's almost no way that a human volunteer that is issuing, uh, say, 1,500 votes over, over an 800, over an eight or 10 hour period or 12 hour period um, uh, at, at random intervals, uh, is not, going to do, is not going to show similarities in the way he times those keys. So then it becomes a job for a robot to figure out if the software in that machine is still honest. So in other words, we've built software, and, or we've, we've concepted software in, 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 with that last point. We've concepted software that we could say, look, you're never going to find out that this software is in there unless you put it through a real election or you use a robot or you just take out the EEPROMs, which by then, of course, was the easiest way. So in other words, you can never figure out if, if this thing defrauds you or not. And in a real election, if you only take 5%, you'll never know. What we also did is our software had a little string in there, uh, like one of the parties that's currently on the board there. Well, people that are interested can play with this machine after we're done, uh, or we can put it somewhere else. Uh, I'm here for two more days. We can even put it in the hack center and, and make a real workbench out of it. Um, but uh, 
basically, we built, uh, we wrote software that has a string in there, and if that string appears in the party name, then that becomes the recipient of the stolen votes, and you can also encode a percentage that you want to have. Like, I want 20% of all votes from, uh, uh, randomly from all votes, 20% uh, go to this, this recipient party, so 20% more than, than the po people that voted for it anyway. And it also said, oh yeah, we also had another one, we never steal uh, from parties that only have a few votes. So if, somebody, if, if only one person votes, like the guy himself in a local election, you should never steal that because then he knows that something's up. Um, uh, but we did, we did it so that it had to match a string. NADOP and governments have always said, and German government is still saying that today, uh, that there's no point in messing with these machines while they're in storage, because then you don't know which candidates are going to be under which button. Whereas the candidate lists travel to this machine on the blue module, and the minute it's started, it can figure out these buttons because it has the party name then because it must display it. So that argument is completely false, and it has always been false. And German government is still making that argument that, that storage isn't, isn't, uh, uh, isn't tricky because you don't know which buttons go to which candidates. Um, one other thing we did was we played a little bit with the radio emissions. This was mostly Frank's thing. Uh, we figured out that the display on these things radiates RF and that on certain frequencies you can actually receive signals and that these signals corresponded to what was, corresponded to what was being voted. Now there's a number of really great graphs but there, I, have, I don't want to go into everything about that. But basically what it meant is that the little display, the little LCD display that's on there, when it's displaying a special character, an accent or an umlaut, it's the Japanese version of the display, so all the accents and all the umlauts are actually loaded as bitmaps to the display. When that happens, as soon as the display has to display at least one bitmap, the refresh frequency drops because it has to do more work every time it draws the display, because it has to get data from RAM instead of just from ROM. Meaning that you could actually, at a distance here, if there was an accent in there, and there's only one party in Holland that had an accent, which was the Christian Democrats, um, so you could actually build something that, that just by listening to a scanner, you could hear what party was being voted. There's a little movie on that later on. Then there's also a burst of data that you heard at the beginning as soon as the button is pressed, which we proved contains all the data need, needed to get the actual content of the display. We never did that because it was, we need to match, it took a lot of digital signal processing that we didn't have time for, but we did have the, the images to prove that these bursts were really different and that they were really the same for the same candidates and different for different candidates. Um, and then there's the emissions from the display. Now a lot of this, this was a really difficult point to get across. From the, the first municipality, we got this machine because some journalists helped us out. A very famous Dutch news broadcast, a uh, news documentary show. They basically gave us permission to use their name and to say we were them. And they went with us with a camera team to actually get the machine. Uh, Somebody had told them that it would probably make good television if we got one of these machines. Um, so they helped us out, uh, and that's what got us the machine. And after a month of hacking, we did this, we did this broadcast, and it actually has English subtitles. It's a little squeezed, but it has English subtitles. I'm going to play, do I have time? Yeah, I got time. I'm going to play all of it. It's 15 minutes worth of, uh, of footage, so I'm just going to sit down. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, hang on. Oops. That's the credits. Now I need to... Sorry about that. Um, I need to hook up the audio. Is there audio here? There must be. Other people played audio, so I get to play audio too. Yeah, but not into my computer. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay, no worries. Okay. No, it's not on yet. Okay, he's 
No worries. Uh, I don't. Uh, Are you sure it's on? No, it's not. There it is. There it is. Um, Goedenavond. Stemmen op een papieren formulier met een rood potloodje is hopeloos ouderwets. Maar het is een stuk veiliger dan stemmen met een computer. Fraude met stemcomputers blijkt een fluitje van een cent te zijn. De beveiliging van die dingen is zo lekker als een mandje. Op 22 november zijn er weer parlementsverkiezingen. Dan bepaalt u wie er in de Tweede Kamer komt. Bijna elke gemeente in Nederland gebruikt deze stemcomputer, de NEDAP ES3B. Volgens de overheid is het apparaat betrouwbaar en veilig. Dit is 100% betrouwbaar. De machines die wij hier hebben staan, die hebben de TNO-goedkeuring. Dus we gaan ervan uit dat dat dan veilig is. We hebben daar geen problemen mee gehad, absoluut niet. Je kunt niet frauderen. Maar is de stemcomputer wel zo veilig en betrouwbaar? Als je gaat graven in het verkiezingsproces blijkt... De beveiliging van de stemcomputer is zo lek als een mandje. En fraude is een fluitje van een cent. We gaan dat stap voor stap bewijzen. In 90% van de Nederlandse gemeente staat een stemcomputer van fabrikant Meda Groenendaal. Maar het bedrijf houdt de software geheim. Uit angst voor concurrentie. Hij zit niet anders op dan mijn zelfheid bemachtigen. De bellen met willekeurige gemeente. Ah, dit is fijn. En al snel hebben we beet. En wij zouden graag voor de uitzending uh, één of twee dagen zo'n machine ter beschikking hebben. Ja. Uh, kan dat via jullie? Dat moet geen probleem zijn. Een dag later halen we hem op. Een stemcomputer met alle randapparatuur. Dat gaat wel heel erg makkelijk. Klaar om hem open te schroeven. Klaar voor uitgebreid onderzoek. Niet in een grote stad zoals gebruikelijk, maar in het landelijke dorpje Vijfhuizen in de Haarlemmermeer hebben we ditmaal de verkiezingen gefilmd. Tot de jaren tachtig deden we het met potlood, papier en een melkbus. Maar als het ver... Duizenden mensen in de stembureau stelden met de hand. Erg veel werk, maar dat maakt de fraude haast onmogelijk. Ben ik dat gewoon? Ja, maar. Ik zat in bijna elke gemeente een stemcomputer. Een druk op de knop en je stem verdwijnt in het apparaat. Je moet er maar op vertrouwen dat hij eerlijk telt. En komt je stem wel bij de juiste partij terecht. Kan je fraude? Uh, zeker, je kunt fraude plegen met een stemcomputer op het moment dat je controle hebt over het apparaat. Anders uh, overal bijkant. Bart Jacobs is hoogleraar aan de Radboud Universiteit Nijmegen. Hij kent de beveiliging van de stemcomputer en maakt zich grote zorgen. Je kunt je programmeren zoals je wil, dus je kunt ook stellen zoals je wil. Al vaak heeft hij de overheid gewaarschuwd voor de slechte beveiliging van de stemcomputer. We hebben het al eerder uh, gezegd in interviews en uh, bij gelegenheid en uh, bij voordracht ook. De overheid is... De audio is cool, is het? Uh, heeft dat niet opgepikt. We hebben onze geleende stemcomputer. ...computer open laten maken en laten onderzoeken door onafhankelijke computerdeskundigen. Dat was in ons land nog nooit eerder gedaan. Het deskundige oordeel is buitengewoon duidelijk. Die stemcomputer is echt onveilig. We starten het onderzoek. Samen met de actiegroep Wij vertrouwen stemcomputers niet. Dit is feitelijk een dag van een dag van Huiscomputer. Goed, we gaan eens even kijken wat we gekregen hebben. Rob Koongrijp is een van de drijvende krachten achter de actiegroep. Hij heeft Access Roll opgericht, Nederlands eerste internetaanbieder. Maar hij is vooral gespecialiseerd in de beveiliging van computers. Eerst kijken we hoe die werkt. Dat begint met de kandidatenlijst voor de verkiezingen. Is het wel voor een machine? Here is basically where we first play with it. They filmed when we first opened the box. This is where we actually run the entire way. This is the PC software. It's used to... Vrij voor kiezing. Welkom toch eens. Set up the data in those blue modules. Nee, gestemd. We gaan het doen. Nou, gaan we de kiezers sluiten? Ik weet niet of dat moet. That's the reader device you see there. This is actually Delphi software that uses um, This is the data and all sorts of Alleen maar begrijpen. Het is alleen maar leren hoe die werkt. Nooit eerder is een Nederlandse stemcomputer zo grondig onderzocht. 
door onafhankelijke deskundigen. Over de resultaten van het onderzoek bestaat geen twijfel. Maar hoe gaat dat eigenlijk, frauderen met een stemcomputer? Alles wat je nodig hebt is een schroevendraaier en twee chips. Op deze chip staat de software waarmee je kan frauderen. Het verwisselen van de chips kost nog geen vijf minuten. De kwaadaardige software zit erin en de computer doet precies wat jij wil. Het is toch wel even schrikken als je je realiseert hoe makkelijk... In de praktijk inderdaad kan. Het is niet best natuurlijk. De chips zijn verwisseld en de verkiezingsfraude kan beginnen. Ik ga je stemmen op alle partijen behalve de fraudeerende partij 2006. Eén stem uitbrengen op het CDA. Zo is klaar, ik ga één stem uitbrengen op de... So this is where we basically turned off all those security features that I just talked to you about. Because otherwise it could very easily be detected as a test election with only four votes. And CDA hebben geen stemmen gekregen. En de frauderende partij 2006 heeft twee stemmen. Zo makkelijk gaat het. De stemmen voor PVDA en CDA gaan naar de frauderende partij 2006. Als je het subtiel doet, heeft niemand het in de gaten. Zelfs de fabrikant niet. Basically, we made a version of the fraud software that's all in here. It has everything turned off. It just goes to the fraud always. Ah. This is where they show how they are stored in Rotterdam. Daar kan ik geen uitspraak over doen. Wij wel. Binnen en buiten is geen beveiliging. Als onze camera uit het zicht is, wordt dat bevestigd. Maar hangen hier veel camera's of alarminstallaties voor dit soort dingen? Niet. Maar zou dat niet moeten dan? Ja, dat is de grote vraag. Een loods met 400 stemcomputers. Zonder bewakingscamera's, zonder alarmsysteem. En bovendien kan je zo naar binnen... Oeps, ik deed dat weer. Oh, dat is bad. Ik dacht dat ik het pauze zou Never mind, ik restart het. Het was heel funny, want dat that, that plek waar ze 400 voting computers hadden, uh, when de camera was al echt really off. And they were walking towards the car together with the woman that's in the picture. She said, "Well, we don't really need security anyway because it's such a bad neighborhood. There was like a, uh, uh, they were growing weed over there and they were doing ecstasy over there. So, and and she literally said, it's really not a problem because nobody dares to come here at night." <laughs> En ze they, they still kicking themselves twee weken later dat ze niet dat hadden. Goedenavond, stemmen. Ik ga naar dat bit over daar een beetje. Nou, dit is heel wel. Dit is wel watched. Nou, dit is gewoon veel mensen reageren op hoe slecht de security is. Dit is een beetje een interessante thought. Uh, So we'll let that run for a bit. Run? For a bit? Run? <laughs> well? Ja, eigenlijk iedereen die toegang heeft. Hoe kan het toch dat de stemcomputer zo slecht is beveiligd? Dat komt door de ouderwetse techniek. Het apparaat stamt uit het midden van de jaren 80. Computerbeveiliging stond toen nog in de kinderschoenen. Toen uh, heerste er een uh, veel groot optimisme met betrekking tot gebruik van computers dan nu. Nu weten we allemaal van virussen, kwaad aardige software, uh, uh, internetverbindingen waar allerlei uh, rommel over uh, binnen kan komen. Toen de tijd was dat besef niet zo doorgedrongen. Dit is de Xbox. Deze populaire spelcomputer is veel moeilijker te kraken dan onze stemcomputer. Als onze samenleving is veiliger dan de stemcomputer. De Xbox is veiliger, want dan kun je niet zomaar je eigen software opdraaien. Ja, wel, dus dan kan je niet keer naar een software. Met deze sleutel start je de stemcomputer. Maar alle stemcomputers in Nederland hebben exact dezelfde sleutel. En hij is makkelijk na te maken. Er valt inderdaad wat voor te zeggen van laten we het er nu nog eens komen. Oh, another funny thing about that key is that when we type that lock manufacturer, it turns out that that particular lock only has one key. There's, uh, And uh, uh, if, you, if you read the report we wrote, uh, both the lock and the lock and key and the key have order numbers. And if you hit that, put that order number into Google, you will find many places that sell that particular key for a euro each. 
So all the keys, all the spare keys we have, all the spare keys we have are actually originals. And the recommended application for the key is office furniture. Goed naar kijken of dat in de huidige situatie nog de meest veilige oplossing is. En dat is dan ja of nee. Nee, ik vind eigenlijk niet. Ik vind eigenlijk niet. Dit, uh, uh, dit past niet meer in deze tijd. De overheid blijft het maar herhalen. De Nederlandse stemcomputer is betrouwbaar en veilig. Het is allemaal zeer vroeg getest. Het zijn zeer betrouwbare machines. En wij gebruiken deze stemmachines niet vanaf 1996. Nee, dat is ongeveer 90. 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 Dat is Dit is PNO in Delft. In Nederland staan in totaal 8000 stemcomputers. PNO test er elke vier jaar slechts eentje. Als bij de kruidenier een weeggas staat, die wordt netjes nagekeken of hij nog wel netjes weegt. Jouw auto wordt nagekeken, uh, uh, liften worden nagekeken, brandplussers worden nagekeken, maar stemcomputers niet hoor. Dat testen we elke vier jaar één van. Is dat wetenschappelijk verantwoord? Nee, dat is niet wetenschappelijk verantwoord, maar er is hier wel meer over op te merken wat uh, uh, twijfelachtig is. Zoals de testrapporten van TNO, die zijn geheim. Publiek en pers mag ze niet inzien. We weten dus niet of de stemmen eerlijk worden geteld. En dan, waar kijkt TNO eigenlijk naar? Je kunt zijn gewoon over alles wat met toevallig te maken. Je kunt er een stroomuitval, je moet geen schok van krijgen, je moet gewoon water overheen kunnen. Je kunt zijn gewoon over temperatuurswisselingen. Maar helemaal niet over een kwaad willing, een kwaad willing die individuen, een kwaad willing die partij die stemmen zouden bestellen. De stemcomputer wordt gemaakt door Nederland Groenendaal, getest door TNO. Het belangrijkste stemproces is uitbesteed aan bedrijven. Weet u, die hebben iemand bij de overheid weet hoe de hele stemmen elkaar zijn? Nee, want dat weet de overheid niet van TNO. Dus niemand bij de Nederlandse overheid weet hoe de stemcomputer werkt. In details zover ik weet niet. Dat weet alleen de TNO en de rest van de De technische details die deze reportage ondersteunen zijn na te lezen op de website van de actiegroep. Wij vertrouwen stemcomputers niet. De Nederlandse stemcomputer, hij is ouderwets, maar je kan er wel mee schaken. Is een schaakcomputer makkelijk te verslaan? Ja, deze spreekt niet zo vast. We hebben de stemcomputer. A large part of the challenge is the 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 underneath of the for, uh, foil keys there is actually uh, 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 plastic. So we had to figure out a way to make the magnetic pieces stick. And Frank Rieger figured out that we could take uh, five cent coins because they're magnetic, and put little pieces of tape, put a piece of paper over it, then put five cent coins on each on each uh, field. And put tape over that, and then put a new piece of paper with the. And then, if you put them right, you could use the edge of the coin to press the foil buttons. So that was. Ter ongeschonden teruggebracht. Klaar voor de komende verkiezingen. Naar de conclusies over de veiligheid van de stemcomputer vragen we een politiek commentaar. Minister Nicolai, die hierover gaat, is op de Antillen. Tweede Kamerleden waren wel in staat om onze reportage te bekijken en te becommentariëren. Lisbeth Spies, CDA. Anyway, so they get these, these parliament, parliamentarians in there uh, looking at it. And this is the thing they're most upset about. Is, oh my god, how could they have gotten a voting computer? <laughs> We must make sure that never happens again. We must make legislation to make sure that no... Outsiders can never get a voting machine anymore. So that's that's the thing that was most shocking to them. Uh, so the minister, at this point, they knew they had a problem. Uh, basically, these MPs wanted the minister wanted the minister to to. Yeah, we know. Um, I just wanted to quickly show, I've shown it before, the credits for this hack, because a lot of people, some of you may know some of these people, buy them a beer, if you see them. <laughs> Now, as part of that broadcast that I didn't play because I skipped it, is the fact that we were announcing, through that broadcast, they announced that we would be taking government to court if they didn't address these issues and if they didn't uh, make for trustworthy e-voting. Um, the court case would be a civil case and it would basically, for a civil case you need harm, you need somebody treating you unjust, and we basically said government is treating anyone unjust if they don't supply for honest elections. And honest elections, we had a, 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 all the treaties and legislation, Ulrich has been through that for the, for the German case, for those that have been to his talk. Uh, basically, we wrote a, a, a 
12-page document uh, sort of listing all the treaties and everything, uh, uh, doing all the legal mumbo-jumbo, our lawyers did, uh, basically saying that we would take government to court. Um, basically defining why we thought, felt voting computers didn't match these criteria. Um, then the next morning, this was on the 4th of October, that broadcast that you just saw, the next morning we had a press conference in the Parliamentary News Center, uh, which had a lot of press. This is just a tiny fraction of what was there. Um, and where we uh, also announced the radio stuff, the, the, the radio leakage. I'll show you more about that later. Um, and uh, we basically told everybody what we knew and a few extra things so they w didn't feel ripped off by having everything in the broadcast of last night. Um, and then that evening, of course, we made all the news. This is just one of the news broadcasts. Dat vindt althans een groep computerkenners die uitvoerig onderzoek deed naar het apparaat dat het potlood heeft verdrongen. De stemcomputer. Anyway, Dutch, so de beveiliging van het apparaat is in, zo lekker als uh, mandje, concludeert de groep. En werkt dus verkiezingsfraude in de hand. As you As you can see, uh, it shows the press conference, it shows the stack of keys. Uh, it shows me changing ROMs. It shows the NADOP guy who basically says, well, it's really funny, this, this group should have called themselves we don't trust people instead of we don't trust voting computers. Uh, and it really doesn't say much more. And, and it's an interesting company, NADOP. It's a very interesting company. Uh, anyway, so this is the... Uh, this is the responsible minister who said that uh, we're, we're doing everything to protect these computers. Uh, we're, we're sealing the, the ROMs and we're sealing the machines and we're, we're putting extra high security seals on everything so nobody can mess with it anymore. And it's completely secure. Uh, we're glad that these things were, were pointed out to us, but now we're fixing them, was basically their statement. As you can see, the Irish TV was there. They were very interested in this as well. And this is the SDU new vote machine, just to, as a lead out. Another thing we did, because it was very hard, we noticed, to get the, to get the, uh, uh, the point across with the, uh, with the secrecy of the ballot, with the radio thing. So we made a little film that we put on YouTube and Google Video. That basically, I'll quit, put you through it a little bit faster. It shows us setting up the machine. It shows the 90% of the vote cost on a, it shows the operation of the machine, that it has an audio signal. It's, it's, it's a very short clip. And then it shows this scanner um, programmed to show. Basically, what we've done is we've taken a scanner and then we fed the audio into the audio in of a TomTom -tom device, which was programmed to detect, to, to distinct between, between these two tones. We didn't feel like explaining this whole thing with the special characters. We just said, here, we can detect what's being voted. It was a very simple clip, basically, so that anybody could see what was going on. Nobody could ever deny it. And here you hear that signal from across the street. And um, then the next morning, of course, there were cartoons like this one. And the fun thing is, you don't, don't only know what people voted, but you also hear all the traffic reports. Um, <laughs> Then at October 12th, there was a parliamentary debate. First, we thought nothing had happened. Oh my God, we did a press conference, we did, we did the hack, and nothing happens. It's like it all dies. Uh, the minister and all the parties present thank us for the good work, and then they, in the same breath they say, but let's make sure you never get another voting machine. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for pointing this out. Now go away, please. <laughs> um, it's the biggest amount of headache I feel that our government has ever thanked anybody for. Um, uh, the minister explains all these short-term measures, putting seals on, on the boxes, uh, uh, making sure that they, that they can still have an election with these NADAP machines. And they announced that the Secret Service, AIVD we call them, uh, will look at these radio emissions because apparently they have some experience in this field. <laughs> um, and he admits that, uh, uh, yes, there are major organizational problems, 
because all these journalists kept asking, but is it true that, that there is no security specification in the regulations? And is it true that uh, TNO only tests one computer? So he admitted that there was major flaws in the, in the legislation and in the way e-voting is implemented. And he announced, and this was really the biggest win, he announced an independent commission to revise the entire process. And this was everything we could win, because that's all government is ever going to do, is, is appoint a commission to look at changes. The minister isn't going to say, well, okay, we'll just not do it anymore. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So this was really the biggest win. Um, then after that, um, the, the media that we had expected to happen on October 4th and 5th, uh, when we were doing these, these uh, announcements, uh, happened on October 12th, when through those statements by the minister, uh, will basically have a, an independent commission, a, a government commission, look at, at the entire process and, and, and see if it needs revising. By, those, by that statement, uh, the minister basically said, these people have been right all along, and the media instantly realized that this was a story that wasn't going to go away, that this was going to go on and on and on, even till past the elections. So there was a huge increase in press. Um, at the same time, of course, we still had this SDU new vote machine. The NADOP for all you can say, is a, is a well-designed machine. It's very sturdy, it never breaks, uh, it does what it's supposed to do, uh, and uh, it's a known function. If you can trust the ROMs, of course you can't, and of course it's, it's still bad for a number of other reasons, but it's, it's a well-designed machine. Now, in Amsterdam, we had to vote on the SDU new vote machine, which was an embedded Windows machine with a GPRS modem built in. So we sent an open letter saying, dear Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, we think they're insecure. We have a number of reasons to think they're insecure because it has a modem, because it's embedded windows, and it does, probably doesn't get security updates. Have us look at it. We'll check it for free. And he said, no, you can't. They're not mine. They're STUs. And then we said, well, that's a privatized election, isn't it? You've lost control over our elections. Uh, which made for another interesting round of press and, and, and going back and forth. And then things got quiet and we were sort of thinking about the next step. I was actually in Berlin when the next step happened. Uh, the next step was completely unexpected. Uh, you remember the, the Secret Service was going to look at the radio aspect. And then on the 30th of October, our responsible minister decertifies the SDU new vote, basically making it no longer legal to be used in elections. Taking 2,000 machines off the market, uh, uh, putting 34 municipalities, because... <laughs> so their license was suspended. Now this was when things started going a little crazy. We were no longer... We were no longer... <laughs> Stemcomputers afgekeurd. Hofstad stemt weer met potlood. This is the opening item. Like the leader before the news starts. And, and then the item is about us. And this is Meer another news broadcast. Stemcomputers voldoen niet. Minister doet ze in de ban. RTL Nieuws. This is... Goedenavond, nieuws van maandag 30 oktober. Het rode potlood is terug van weg geweest. Straks bij de verkiezingen duikt het in zo'n 35 gemeenten weer op. Want 10% van de stemcomputers is afgekeurd. Ze blijken niet te zijn. Het is namelijk zo sterk dat dat 10 parameters van de computer zo zeker kan worden dat iemand stemt. En is er geen sprake van geheime stemming. What we did on election day. The computers deugen niet. Zal ik nog even drukken zo? De actie komt bij vertrouwen stemcomputers niet. Ik zei het al eerder. Stemcomputers zijn af te luisteren. Volgens mij is de Nicolai met 90 procent alles oké. Maar de overige 10 procent computers van het bedrijf SDU deugen niet. Coming into that press conference. So this is when it really got. Crazy. This is when, when the press went crazy, when everybody went crazy. Concludeert de AIVD dat op enkele tientallen um, meters. This is when this kind of cartoon happened. <laughs> That's the... The three crosses are the Amsterdam City logo. Uh, um, at that point, 
we were becoming sort of scared at the amount of chaos we were causing. Because at, at this point, the minister didn't only announce that he was decertifying the, uh, uh, the SDU new vote machine, but he also announced that nobody except the voter and the person operating that little button should get within five meters of a need-up. That um, uh, the entire nation's police force would be mobilized to surveil the polling stations to make sure that nobody would be walking around with suspicious equipment. So this is when the entire country started going profoundly nutty, prof nuttier than we really wanted them to go. Um, we announced there would be no court case, basically because we were afraid of winning, more than we were afraid of losing. Because the SDU case proved that by then uh, uh, they were supporting all the municipalities that had to switch either back to NADAP because there was some stock of NADAPs they found partly in Germany. So, <laughs> Your voting machines are actually being lent to other nation states and then returned and used. So, um, so they found stocks of NADAP machines for some of these communities. Uh, other communities, such as Amsterdam, had to switch back to paper because Amsterdam made up half of these machines that they couldn't use anymore, so they could never find that many. So Amsterdam, and only, Amsterdam had only done one e-vote, so all the expertise to do paper was still there. Um, uh, so we were getting, getting kind of scared, figuring this amount of chaos for 34 communities, there's like 500 municipalities in Holland, 480 or something, 34 communities not being able to use the machine they were supposed to be using, uh, became a round-the-clock job for 50 support people at the ministry. 50. Um, the ministry couldn't do anything else anymore. They were going completely berserk. Um, Everybody was, and they said we have a plan B. If this court case uh, 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 happen, happens to ban the, the need up machines, uh, then we'll just go vote on paper. Uh, we later, from multiple sources, heard that they had no plan B. The plan B was to postpone the elections. Now, Dutch, Dutch electoral law doesn't, doesn't have postponed elections. It doesn't. <laughs> Because that's what governments would want to do, wouldn't it? Wouldn't they just postpone the elections? So electoral law doesn't provide for that. So that would, that would mean Holland would be thrown into what's called a constitutional crisis. That's when government is basically illegal. Um, and that's n n not something we would ever want to cause. Because if you think about it, that would make everybody really mad at us. Parties would say, yes, but that's mean, that, mean we peaked, that means we peaked too early, now the other guys won. All sorts of chaos would have happened that wouldn't, nor, wouldn't naturally necessarily be conducive to our arguments. Um, then, as part of the election, and because this is really close to the elections, this is already in November, that this is all happening. We announced, by the way, the... Um, uh, the fact that we were not doing this court case, we announced that by sending emails out to the press, to our press list, uh, at 10 minutes to 1, and then we had to go drive somewhere because we had an appointment. Uh, and then at 10 minutes to 1, we announced this, and then uh, we turned on the radio, and it, was, it made the 1 o'clock radio newses. Uh, <laughs> By this point, things had gotten really... We were the election issue. We were bigger than any party's political campaign. Uh, uh, which is really strange, if you think about it. It's, it's well, below, well, well beyond anything we had hoped for. Um, because we cancelled the court case, we suddenly were realos. We weren't fundis anymore. Which, uh, which got us a lot of criticism. It got us a lot of criticism from people that didn't understand from people that said we should go on fighting and, and, and uh, die fighting if necessary. Um, <laughs> these people never, never run in front of you. They always are behind you going, die fighting. Um, <laughs> um, and as part of the elections, uh, uh, we knew this a little bit beforehand, but as part of these elections, uh, governments always, as part of any national election, they send out invitations to all these international bodies, please come observe our elections, feel welcome to observe our elections. And 
As a rule, these bodies say, well, nah, you're Germany or you're Holland. Never, don't worry, just do your elections. Don't worry about it. Um, in our case, we got the OSCE uh, uh, to do a fact-finding mission because there was obviously problems with e-voting in the country that, was, that had e-voting 100% and where e-voting was non-controversial. Um, it wasn't a full election observation mission. Uh, what is there to observe? Person presses button, printout comes out. Numbers are consistent with printout. Uh, um, so we had this fact-finding mission, and we, they visited, as, as part of their mission, we had the mission visit my house, which is also a really interesting <laughs> event. Um, and it's really interesting, uh, at least it was, it was good for me to notice that, that I was telling them all these things that we had learned, like the, the fact that, that our internet voting uh, the government was basically supplying uh, their own or, or a very close to government printing press with a list that could basically be used to get everybody's vote. And uh, uh, they were shocked. Like, oh my God. Uh, you mean the Secret Service can calculate what everybody voted? And we said, yeah. And, and it's, it's good to see that, that outside of our borders, people actually do get shocked. Uh, um, Holland is a country which traditionally has a very large amount of trust in government. And governments sort of on average have been relatively trustworthy. So it's, 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 uh, we have too much trust in government now that governments the world over are changing, I guess, in a way. Um, then election day rolled around. And as part of election day, I'll show you the news broadcast. Again, we made all the news. Niet overal gebeurt het stemmen met de stemcomputer. In tien gemeenten stemmen ze altijd al met het potlood. En nog eens 24 andere gemeenten zijn daartoe gedwongen. Dat werd door de actiegroep taarten gedistribueerd in Amsterdam. Wij delen appeltaart uit omdat we heel blij zijn dat... We passed out apple pie uh, to all polling stations in Amsterdam. That's 500 of them. So we bought two pallets worth of apple pie. Uh, and, and carted them and had 25 teams in a car driving them to every polling station in Amsterdam, basically thanking these people with a nice letter with it, thanking them so that, because they had control over elections back. Um, because we figured that if, if, uh, if 1,500 people talk to half a million other people in a grumpy mood about us, about this crazy action group that, that got us to do this paper counting again and we hate it and, it's, it's, uh, and we're upset and... Uh, that's not good. If half a million people hear a negative story about you, that's bad. So we figured we'd do something about it. Mensen in de stembureaus hun controlerende functie. De link van de stemmen werkelijk klopt. It's just Dutch stuff. Um, so then the elections were over. It was December. Things were eerily quiet because all the media attention was gone. Um, and the ministry didn't do anything anymore, and we didn't have anything to react to. No press releases to write about stupid stuff that they did. They didn't have any press releases to write about stuff we did. Um, this is all done by the Constitutional Affairs and Legislation Department at the ministry. This is normally the quietest department of the ministry. This is where people don't run, they walk. This is... Um, uh, and this time, uh, they were working like crazy. There's lots of people there that, that just were working long, long, long weeks ever since July. Um, and we met some of them at the, at the Kisraat event where they, where they uh, uh, did the official results, where they announced the official counts. And some of these people looked mighty tired. We talked to some of them and, and we, we, we interacted to some of the people that were on the other side, which are good people. These people mean well, they, they, they've lost control of the elections, which is bad, we must take them back, we must force them to take these, this control back. But they're good people, they're, they're, they're friendly, and they have been working 80, 100 hour weeks just like we had, ever since the elections were, were early and then our campaign came. So we got some time to relax, uh, reflect a little bit, and then just a couple of days ago, the commission was announced. The chairman is a former justice minister and a former chairman of parliament. He's one of the wiser elder statesmen. We have a club of wiser elder statesmen who are actually officially appointed to help out government if something really gets bad. 
sort of the, the troubleshooters, and he's definitely one of them. And it really all depends on who the computer experts and, and the municipal election guy are going to be as to who, as to what the, where this leads to, where this is all going to go. Um, this is some of the questions that they've asked this commission. Really good questions. How did the introduction happen? Who is responsible? They realize something has gone wrong. A special subcommission is actually doing nothing but looking back. Which mistakes have we made and what can we learn from them? Which is an exemplary reaction from government. I mean, you just do a couple months of activism and then they look back and figure out what we've done wrong. Um, then there's election related questions. What is the role of IT? Which step needs to be revised? Are all the responsibilities assigned? Is the election process verified, monitored closely enough? Who should do this? What authority is needed? And then there's also voting computer-related questions. Which inherent risks are connected to the current voting machines, electronic voting in general, or voting with pencil and paper? Are, these alterna are there alternatives? And then they ask about internet voting, which is the only thing we need to block now. The only thing we need to do right now to get a paper trailer, to get something that, that, that is verifiable, is to make sure that they don't flee forward into the direction of internet voting. Uh, but I don't think they will, but we have to make sure that they don't. Uh, anyway, so these are, these are pretty wise questions. How do technological developments interact with the election process? Elections are weird because they don't happen for three years every once in a while. And in IT, the world really changes in three years. So every time they run an election, the world has changed. Um, from now on, I'll be skipping back and forth between thoughts and slides and crazy stuff. Um, this is sort of the attention that this topic had gotten before 2006. This is what happens if, if packages, presentation packages have really nice graphing features. You end up using them. So indulge with me. This is my first keynote presentation. Um, this is actually the attention this topic had gotten, where blue is just mentions of e-voting in general, and red just specifically mentions how can we trust the result. It specifically mentions the key question. And you can see 98 sticking out because there was lots of problems with e-voting, because that's the year everybody got virus scanners, and all the networks slowed down because this software package kept opening and closing its, its file ever, because it was from the 80s. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's the 98 peak. And then in 2004, those were all the Irish, all the press that, that was gotten because of the Irish refusing to use our, our machine. Uh, as you can see, 22 mentions in 2004 of our issue. And then came 2006. <laughs> um, July is when we started our campaign. And we already noticed that at 30, mainstream media mentions, because these are all mentions in mainstream media. At 30, 35 mainstream me media mentions, that was already above their pain threshold. This was already hurting. This was, so you can imagine what October did to them. <laughs> now, of course, we haven't won the war. This is just humor. Uh, there's still a lot of work needs to be done. Also in Holland, we need to monitor what the Commission is doing. We need to make sure that it's not just delay tactics. Uh, although we, we're, we are confident that they really do want to change the system. They really do want to add verifiability to the elections. They do see the point. And even if they don't see the point, they know that lots of other people do and that they need to do something because otherwise the headache is going to come back and come back and come back. Um, these are some of the reasons. I think for me, most important is the situation in the USA it just means that, that this issue is going to come back and come back and come back for the next decade. And it's going to infect more and more countries where there is black box voting, even if nothing else happens in these countries, it's going to, it's going to come back. Um, people understood the issues. We proved actual flaws, which is really important. Also, there isn't any real adversaries. This campaign wouldn't have been this easy if we were fighting Monsanto or if we were fighting Shell, or if we were fighting... I'm, I'm honest enough to, to admit that these are flaky adversaries. What? Gross turnover, a couple of million. Uh, uh, strange business of writing software used by a couple of hundred mun municipalities. Basically good-willing people that are just misled by this one character that doesn't understand security and doesn't understand uh, where the trust should lie. Um, these aren't real adversaries also. 
and we had a lot of luck. It, we could have easily failed getting a NADOP, which would have basically made it very uncertain that our campaign would have gone anywhere. Although, if you remember the, the graph with the, with the media mentions, also at 30 media mentions per month, we were convincing people. We were getting more and more serious mentions. We were taken more and more seriously at that rate. Had we kept that up, the issues would have gotten across also. It didn't all depend on getting the NATO. Um, I think it's important to mention in this audience that it was a real hacker campaign. It makes people think about trust, and computers, technology. It's about universal access to knowledge. We must be able to, to find out how our own voting process works, social engineering, lockpicking, reverse engineering, well-executed media strategy. In other words, it's like we've been training for this for 20 years. <laughs> oh my God. Um, another thing, as I said, I'm just jumping thoughts right here. Um, uh, another thing uh, that pops to mind is I need to explain why E&I voting is still being pushed. Why would anybody want this? There's a lot of pressure from special interest groups, and especially the blind lobby in Holland is very strong. They see their politicians often. And they want machines where blind people can vote independently from being helped uh, because it's actually, you can actually help blind people vote. That's legal. You can't help people that are, for instance, mentally handicapped. But blind, anybody that's physically unable to find the button or to find the, the, the mark on the piece of paper, you can help them, the, the, the people in the office, in the uh, polling station. But that's an important lobby. And it's a legitimate interest also. It's a legitimate interest not to have to tell anybody what you're voting. Um, and there's also lots of voting, lots of people that want voting from a different polling station if you're not in your hometown, so you still vote for your own municipal election. Suppose it's a municipal election day. You still vote for your own election, but you're not home. Uh, and all the technical people at the ministry, but also at all these companies and at, at lots of other companies, have told government that this is all possible. Maybe some of us are even responsible for saying, yeah, sure, you can do that, you can organize that, you can use the internet to do anything. Um, and a lot of people ended up believing this, and there's a lot of pressure from Parliament to get these things done for a legitimate reason. Uh, take, for instance, the issue of prisoners voting. You can't register prisoners in, in the municipality where the prison is, because sometimes prisons are pretty big and municipalities are pretty small. The, the prison would dominate the municipality. So, Prisoners must vote, if they have the right to vote, if, if it's not taken from them as part of their, of their conviction, then prisoners vote in their home municipality, and, and they can't go home, so they must then get somebody else to vote for them if that's legal in the system. Um, legitimate interests again. Uh, there's also pressure from city employees, just simply too lazy to count the votes. E-voting is great. For, for getting people to sit in the, in the polling station because they can actually go home when it's all over and watch the TV. Because it's really ir ironic that the people that organize the elections are the ones that don't get to see the outcome until they come home way after it's all over. Um, and there's the desire to feel modern, to feel high-tech, to be part of this modern world. Uh, it's ironic that, that these computers were introduced, these were often the first computers in, in certain schools in the 80s and 90s. Many schools in Holland, this was their first computer. There's so many places where government could do so much more with computers, and they have to use it on this. Um, another thing that popped to mind, why does Germany have e-voting? Does anybody know? Germany has e-voting because some city officials in Cologne were jealous because Maastricht people got to go home earlier. It's true. This is why... This is why your government was pushed into introducing it here. I also wanted to quickly point that this was very much a Dutch-German campaign. As you can see, lots of people from Berlin and other places in Germany have helped out. Uh, the situations are very similar. If it dies in Holland, it probably dies in Germany, so that's why we started the campaign in Holland. But there's really lots of reasons to start campaigning here in Germany. I'll show you one. Um, very comparable to the situation in Germany, except we're smaller and much more urbanized, and we had a severe crisis in education. 
and any developments involving technology, stupidity, and a combination of those are, much like, are likely to in, happen in Holland first. <laughs> um, having said that, the most likely outcome of what we're having in Holland is, is a verifiable system, either paper trail or who knows, even paper ballots. And Germany might find itself in a huge rollout, because NADAP is ready to sell. And, and lots of German municipalities in all the Bundesländer where it's legal are ready to buy. So you may find yourself in the middle of a huge rollout, much bigger than Holland, of systems that we're just getting rid of. Um, which is something that, that you should all get involved in. Um, there's a lot of things that need to happen in Germany. One of them is to get an ADAP, for which, because then you can actually prove that it's insecure on a German machine, because otherwise they'll just say, well, that, that's a Dutch machine and German machines are different. And, um, <laughs> um, I highly advise going by the book. Um, we haven't broken any laws in the Netherlands in the course of this campaign, and I think that's the single thing that annoyed them the most. <laughs> um, also, it's a lot of work to do something surreptitiously to get these NADAPs and then to actually document them in a way where other people can reverse engineer them. It's not just a matter of dumping the ROMs, it's making pictures of everything, making sure that you never need to go back and see the device again. Making sure, and then having basically two teams, the team that knows who did it and the team that doesn't, and, and just don't, go, don't even go there. Keep it all by the book. Um, another reason we all need to hurry, not just Germany, but everybody here in Europe needs to hurry, is US manufacturers are coming to Europe. ESNS, one of the three big manufacturers in the US, there's been Sequoia, ESNS, and Diebold, um, they're ready to enter the Dutch and German markets, and others will follow. Now, legislation in Germany and legislation in Holland is, doesn't prescribe anything. They could bring whatever they have in the US with all their touchscreen calibration problems and all their crazy stuff that's happening there, uh, plus all the, the rumors of intentional fraud, these manufacturers could be entering the Dutch market and, and, I mean, nothing we've seen so far prepares us for what's going to happen if these people come. So we protect our elections fast. Um, so what needs to happen now? We need to kill the black box voting phenomenon. I think it's dying. I think it's dying worldwide. There's federal legislation being prepared in America to demand uh, paper trail, but they only demand it on new installations, and they've just bought three and a half billion dollars worth of black box voting stuff, so that's bad. But at least they know it's 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 not something that that can happen too much into the future. Um, I think it's dying also in Europe after what we've done to NADAP and after what's going to happen in other countries as this gets more and more attention. This topic is never going to go away, so. We've set up a website which is still very much under construction. It's also a wiki, except it doesn't have any of the nice skin, it doesn't have any of the nice stuff. But it's definitely a place that people could start putting stuff about their national situation, uh, start thinking, start coordinating, um, get involved. Um, this is basically what we have to explain to all our politicians. <laughs> These issues will just haunt you. We will do whatever is necessary to get rid of these machines. Computers, sorry. Um, <laughs> there's another loose thought that popped into my head that I wanted to throw out here because there's lots of people that may be able to do something about it. There is the software issue. There is lots of software being used in elections and it's usually very crummy stuff and some of it is written by the people that actually sell the black box voting equipment. It's the tabulation stuff. It's the software that creates the results from the individual polling stations. Whether there's black box voting used or whether it's just a paper vote, there's lots of software in between, and a lot of that is not open. Uh, I found out after my last election how hard it is to get results at the polling station level in some machine-readable form from all these different municipalities. 
so that nobody really except the government, and the government needs NADAP software to do it, uh, and there's no regulations whatsoever regarding that software, nobody except the government can actually do the addition, can actually do the math. So that's bad. Um, so this is the current situation. These packages are complex in the sense that they're real election workflow management, and there's lots of official documents. Every candidate has to be notified that his, that his application is now official, and then there has to be a notification that the period has ended for this, and then... The, so in the preparation for an election there, and, and, and in the aftermath, there's tons of official paperwork happening, also at the municipal level. And a lot of that is done by ISS, Integral Stemsystem, or IWS, Integrales Wahlsystem, as they call it in Germany. Uh, a lot of that is done by the software in the form of word templates, but it's still, it takes a lot of work from the election workers. It's very lame sort of stuff, and it comes with black box voting. And I think some open source election management software is in order. There could be, I'm sort of in my, in my brain, I'm envisioning some kind of international effort to make software that helps election officials the world over, where basically the country's election system is a module. Um, there's no huge competition, there's just a couple of really shoddily written software packages. Um, and I think we could do well. Um, you could import and export data from all sorts of formats, including comma delimited and spreadsheet formats. Um, you could envision the country election body, the Bundeswahlleiter or, or, or whoever, publishing a blank spreadsheet with all the formulas in it. And then you could just import all the data at, at, the, at the lowest possible level, at, at, at the level of each polling station separately. And you could press the button and it could, would go all the way to parliament seats without, uh, uh, without needing any software. You could just have the spreadsheet do that. Um, you could do cryptographic signatures. Uh, 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 you could start spreading tools that way, real-time graphs, be the media, serve the media share ways you can view the data. I don't know, interesting ways. Um, and the kicker is you could do a GNU plus no black box voting license, meaning that the software cannot be used to process data that comes from non-verifiable sources. And some ideas as to how that could possibly be financed. Or, it's really not that big a project. NADAP writes this, this software that, that's used all over Europe by, by these countries that have their system. They have a few people full-time doing software, both for this machine and for, for, the, for the election management software. There's no huge job here. It's not like Apache. It's not like anything else that's open source. It's really manageable. Another thing everybody here should be considering uh, is to become a poll worker. Talk to your municipality. Um, if, you really feel, if you really feel the elections need to be verifiable and that they belong to all of us, then you should also be willing to do the grunt work. Uh, it's underpaid, it's boring, but they're facing an aging crowd. They're facing... Uh, uh, I've seen it in Amsterdam as we, as we took these apple pies around. Uh, average age is over 50 in Dutch polling stations. And so young people are needed. A new wave of people is needed to protect the elections. If there are no poll workers, nobody counts the votes. And if nobody counts the votes, everybody will use e-voting. And everybody uses e-voting. Democracy ends. It's really that simple. This is sort of my closing thought. There's no sense in having elections unless you know how they work. Um, this is nice. I kept a lot of time for discussion. Let's have questions. Um, yeah, let's, let's explain how we do this. Um, there's one microphone. And uh, I suggest we only have one microphone. Let, let's use that one because it's closest to me. Sorry. No, no, no. But, 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 but um, my suggestion is to use one microphone because then we have one cue. 
instead of having to swap back and forth. Uh, is that okay with everybody, just queuing on this one microphone? Um, so, when I was, my understanding of the, the, this Dutch scenario is that the reason that the voting machines were taken off was not because of the untrustworthiness of the machines, but because of the emissions. Yes. Uh, that. So it seems like well, we that's sort of the, the won the battle they... for the wrong reasons. Yes. We won for the wrong reasons in terms of the SDU machine. The thing is, that's the only question they could ask that they knew wouldn't uh, compromise their use of the NetApp machine, or they, fear, they figured wouldn't compromise their use of the NetApp machine. Uh, going into computer security, uh, to them was a can of worms, so they, 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 I think, deliberately kept the question to the Secret Service really, really narrow. Yeah, uh, I'd like to know if, you know, I, th I mean, personally, I think open source is bullshit if for voting machines or for voting computers because, you know, I can't take my laptop into the voting booth to check if the open source is still no, correct. No, there's no the point in having open source if you can't verify that it's running on the particular machine that you're voting in front of. Yeah, that's you're this right, is true. But, but I, I, want, I, I don't want, you know, um, your opinion whether, you know, um, I mean, I, I think you should have pen and papers and nothing more, no crypto stuff, no nothing, you know. Pen, paper, and that, that's it. I'm, I'm, and, um, well, the thing is, this is true for, uh, in my opinion, this is true for what happens in the polling station, uh, but it's not necessarily true for once the results are published. If you have the results per polling station and if they are openly available, then by all means, let's have software to verify that the addition is right. Uh, also, uh, I'm not sure I am completely against any use of computers in the polling station. I can envision, there's countries that have really complex elections, where there's like all these citizen initiatives, like in Switzerland, or where they're voting for uh, the city dog catcher and the sheriff and who knows what. Uh, uh, and there's countries that have really complex, hairy elections. And computers as a disambiguation tool, as an aid to creating a piece of paper which is then counted, for all I'm concerned, it could be counted autom automatically or even sort it automatically so it's easy to count. Uh, I can see all sorts of ways where technology can still help us. I'm, not, I'm no way fundamentalist about the issue. Uh, my comment is that Diebold is actually publishing job ads right now, so if anyone is looking for a job in the voting environment. Oh yes, by in, all in means, Germany. let's, uh, anybody that has the option of infiltrating uh, uh, a voting, <laughs> Make sure you get the documents out without getting caught. Make sure they're not marked. Make sure there's no fingerprints. Uh, use Tor. But if you have the option of infiltrating somewhere where they write black box voting equipment, uh, by all means do. Um, I wanted to say that I think you have it absolutely right that the situation in the United States is quite nightmarish. We, I've been having nightmares about it for a while now. What would, if you could briefly speak, what do you think the best steps that could be taken there to take Diebold down and get this issue off of our backs? Thermonuclear weapons. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, to get the issue off of our backs, I think we have to raise awareness, which is happening globally already. This issue is, uh, it was nowhere one year ago. It was, it was a fringe issue that nobody knew about 12 months ago. It's now a major issue uh, in, in many, many, many countries. Many people know about it. It's in cartoons. It's all over the papers. And that's only going to increase. So thanks I think, well, not just thanks to me, thanks to a lot of people, actually. Um, and the situation in the US is actually helping. It's actually being very helpful in getting these issues out there, because you actually have dirty elections. Whereas. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> um, I was uh, uh, just curious uh, why uh, you cancelled uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the court case uh, instead of uh, postponing it to after the elections. Uh, because, because we couldn't win. If we had, uh, uh, 
chances were we would have lost. Uh, not because we felt we had a bad case, but because judges end up being pragmatic when constitutional crisis is a word. Uh, in, in, uh, in, judges no, become in, very... Uh, uh, if you do it now... Uh, 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 let, me, let, me, let me finish. We felt... Sorry. And if you lose a case, uh, in the eyes of the public it means you had no case, because otherwise you would have won your case. It's very hard to convey that the strategy for legislation for, for pursuing a case is different than political strategy. Uh, and that you may, you may lose although you were right or that you may... Getting these things across to the public is very, very hard. So having lost the case would have really set us back. Uh, we had lost the SDU new vote, which had never been tested by anybody for security, which was a really strong point. I'm honest enough to say that that was really a reason, uh, was really good on their part is we had lost an important point in our, case, in, our, in our lawsuit. Also, had we won, the country really would have gone into chaos. Um, no, uh, if and, you won before the elections. Sorry? Uh, if you won before the elections, but, uh, if, uh, 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 but uh, if you win uh, when there are years before the next election, uh, there, uh, there is time enough uh, not to have chaos. Well, right now, right now, I first want to see what comes out of this commission. Hmm. Uh, because uh, I feel that, that going really adversarial right now, really going, going with the hammer, uh, isn't all that necessary. Mm. Uh, because I think they've gotten the point. Uh, if, if, if we all become convinced that they didn't or that they're trying to, to uh, uh, get rid of us uh, without giving us any changes, uh, then of course that changes. But for now, I'm, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt uh, in terms of this commission. So I'm, I first want to see what comes out of that. I was just going to add an extra reply on the situation in the United States. Uh, I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation and we've actually had some uh, promising successes in fighting the, uh, the crazy situation in the United States. Uh, one big victory is we managed to get a devolved machine and get it to some computer security researchers at Princeton. Uh, Ed Felton managed to uh, write a virus for this devolved machine and then Fox News showed the virus uh, on primetime television. So that, that's making progress. There's also a lawsuit uh, going on at at the moment in Florida, there was uh, one county where the, the numbers that came out looked extremely suspicious uh, and that may have been due to fraud in the machines or it may have just been due to confusing graphics uh, on the voting screens, uh, but there's a lawsuit going on there at the moment and maybe there'll be a, a rerun of the election in that, that county. So we'll talk more about this tomorrow, in the, tomorrow or the day after in the EFF session. Okay. If I remember correct, correctly, um, you wrote that the Commission will report by September 2007. The Commission, yes. Isn't that far too much time? Far too much time? Uh, this is a government commission. Uh, um, I, don't, I don't expect to see us having a completely new voting system anytime before 2010. Uh, just because that's the speed of change in government. If you change a, a, a core process, the way government is organized, it's just not going to happen next year. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly realistic about that. It needs to change faster. I would love it to change faster. I'm just not holding my breath. I'm not expecting it any faster. And is it guaranteed that um, uh, people from your group will be inside that commission? No, we, we explicitly said we did not want to be in the commission. They were probing to see if we, were, if we were going for the commission. The thing is, this commission is independent, meaning that anything, any, anybody in that commission that, that has had a point of view before the commission started doing its research is suspect. And the commission would then have to look, do interviews with the field. And the field would have us missing from it because we were in the commission. And how the, the two um, experts will be selected? I have no clue. Uh, th this is at the discretion of the, of the interior ministry, of the minister and of the, of the chair, chairman so this, of the commission. So this, mean, this means that it is not impartial if the government chooses who will um, be there. Well, it's not made out of, it's not uh, uh, built uh, out of part, uh, it's not built out of people that are there representing anybody. It's built out of people representing themselves. That's what they call an independent government commission. Um, 
The thing is, I think they want to fix the problem, and they want to fix it by giving us elections that are verifiable. Uh, because they know that the headache is going to come back and come back, I think we've actually convinced them that this is true. That, they, that the amount of headache that they've just had. If, if you want to convince any government in, in Germany, Austria, or wherever you're from, convince any government in the next year, they can call the Interior Ministry in Holland and just ask anybody, including the janitor, whether, whether uh, getting voting machines is a good idea. And they'll get the right answer. Um, so I think they actually want to fix the problem, so I think our interests actually align. I've got a question that isn't directly related to what you do, but the uh, way how you do it, um, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Sure. Uh, the thing is, is uh, something that we have guess we've all experienced, the problem of the blind followers, as you created that will blindly believe anything you say to them. Um, do you have any advice on how to get rid of those without too much fallout? Without too much fallout. Uh, we basically put a couple of questions in the FAQ. Uh, uh, basically saying, uh, uh, I deal with conspiracies a lot and I believe uh, the aliens are uh, controlling my brain via satellite and uh, uh, everything was a Mossad plot and uh, uh, can I help you guys? And, and, and the answer is no. Go away. Uh, 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 I think you have to be fairly serious about what you're doing. You have to be serious about the fact that you're campaigning. And this is not about giving everybody the opportunity to campaign alongside you, no matter how crazy they are. This isn't an equal opportunity children's workshop. This is serious campaigning, and, and you're facing people that will use the, the presence of these people to say that you're just a bunch of crazies. So, yeah, and, and that's, that's a point, that's an argument that you can get across. I've actually, people have called me, and I, I told them this on the phone. Look, uh, the fact that you Put, that you operate a website, because the vapor trail thing was actually somebody that called me, who had a major website that, that he put us on that was also very much about these vapor trails. Uh, and I said, look, you have a website that deals with, with a government conspiracy to sedate us all with chemicals from commercial airliners. Uh, that doesn't make, that doesn't do well for our campaign. And, and, and you could be the nicest person on earth, but no thanks, bye. Okay, um, thank you. Um, you mentioned that um, being a poll worker isn't quite attractive um, and I'm from Austria and we had um, uh, national elections in October and I was looking into the, all the, the, the rules and laws regarding um, poll workers and it was quite interesting to find out that um, all you need to, to become a poll, poll worker in Austria is that you need your primary registered place of residence residents in Austria. So you can be an immigrant or whatever. Mm -hmm. All you have, all you need is, is uh, your primary residence in, in Austria. Um, that's so much on the poll worker issue. Um, uh, one more comment that, comment that, that well, is, is quite positive that is that um, um, a, a spokesperson of the minist Ministry of the Interior in Austria said that um, uh, electronic voting is not going to happen. And that was very nice to know. So. Smart move. Yeah. I thought so too. Five minutes, okay. Hi, Rob. Just a uh, quick comment about USA. Also, um, Alameda County in California, the average age of the poll workers is actually like 65 plus in November, last November. And uh, the vo electronic voting machines in Alameda County were also not allowed to be used because they had no paper trail. Mm -hmm. I have only a small mark because you told uh, about different voting system. We have at university a seminar and we show uh, have a look at the different voting system and we found, find out that if the voting system is more complex, they have a uh, less problems with uh, unsolved or don't verified votes. Mm -hmm. you, I think it's no it's reason voting, to say... Voting systems need to be very simple. They need to be... Uh, uh, people in Azerbaijan, people in, in uh, 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 other countries, where was this? Azerbaijan was the one uh, and uh, uh, Ukraine was the other. People actually went to the polling stations to, uh, uh, to see what was happening to their, to their ballots, to actually watch the fraud happen, 
to watch government take away their ballots and replace them by, by other ones. Uh, if you have a paper system that is really simple that anyone can understand, you can force your government to do the fraud in front of your very eyes. In this case, it was the government coming in and taking the ballot boxes at gunpoint because there had been a terrorist threat and the ballot boxes needed to be protected. Um, so, uh, but you can only do that if you can muster up thousands of people that understand how the process works, which in my mind rules out any cryptographic system, technical system, because I could never get a couple thousand people to monitor, monitor the security parameters of a system that I couldn't teach them to understand in, in, in an hour. So, yes, election systems need to be very simple. Yeah, but um, it shows that countries with a complex system, they have no, no problem in verified uh, or wrong votes, they don't count because the voters are too stupid to, to make the right crosses. They are mm -hmm. less in countries with complex system instead of system they only have to vote That's an interesting. Wrong. So unintentional spoiled ballots go up when the system is simpler. That's yeah. interesting. Be because I don't, this is very sick. Okay. We don't understand our uh, voting system, so we need computers. A little okay, bit well, there's lots of strange reasons for using computers. Uh, uh, they've also said that, that uh, election turnout would go up if there was internet elections or if there's elections by SMS, which has actually happened in, in England, uh, uh, or elections by any other mechanism. And consistently, research proves that uh, turnout in elections does not depend on the technology used and does not depend on how easy it is you, to cast your vote. Okay, okay, we have to stop. Just a final word from me. Um, trying to get the word out in Germany also means approaching parties. I think this haven't been mentioned. Just recently, we managed to persuade the Greens to have a basic decision on, you know, stop voting computers. The funny thing was that the Green Party made this decision using computers. So they had like actually voting computers in place deciding to get rid of voting computers. So thanks, Rob. Uh, we have to yeah, I'm, I'm, prepare I'm, the next I'll be song. off the stage uh, uh, really soon. Um, um, the one thing, what I'd like to see happen in Germany is a campaign that, that looks a little bit like ours in terms that it has people that do nothing else, even if just for a month or just for a couple months. But you need people here that don't just do one action or don't just do one press release. But we need people in Germany, a few, two, three, four, five, six, that do nothing else for a few months to see where this leads. Uh, I have no idea how to structure this and I don't in one way or another propose that we can just transplant the entire Dutch campaign because reality is much different here. But that's, I think, what's needed. So get together with other people, try to see if you have the right skill set or some subset of the right skill set. Uh, get together, organize, because it's really important. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>